Welcome to my new Let's Play of Sonic the Hedgehog 4! As a sequel to the original trilogy and CD, this might be one of the most notorious 2D Sonic games, so I thought it'd be fun to see how it holds up. The adventure begins in Splash Hill Zone Act 1, and already, we have a lot to talk about. Sonic 4 was announced in 2009 and released in late 2010. As soon as it was announced, it was immediately very polarizing because of its aesthetics. For example, we have a modern Sonic design with a 3D model instead of sprites in what is essentially Green Hill Zone with different music. The merging of classic and modern elements was very divisive. In addition, in terms of the gameplay, we also have the homing attack from the adventure games, and the physics are completely different from the classic age, and in general, they don't feel great. This game was relatively well received by critics at the time, it's currently sitting around a 75 considering the different platforms, but fans were not happy with this game at all, and this continues to this day. Personally, I played this game many years after Sonic Mania released, so I feel like I approached it from a very different mindset. I already knew that it was very divisive, and since we had Mania, I didn't really have to worry about getting a good classic Sonic game someday, which fans of the series had to do at this point, where we might not have gotten something like Mania, and this might have been it for 2D Sonic games, so that concern was rather valid. Like in the classic games, since we have 100 rings, we'll be able to enter a special stage, This stage is played by using the control stick or D-pad to rotate the screen. Pressing A or B will cause Sonic to jump. Spin Sonic through the map to get the Chaos Emerald. Episode 1 special stages use Sonic 1 rules. You have to have 50 rings by the end of the stage, and we have this little rotating maze. Except this works slightly differently because, instead of moving Sonic through the maze, we actually move the whole stage itself. I'll be honest, I am not going to go after the Chaos Emeralds in either Episode 1 or 2 because I actually don't like the special stages in 1 because of motion sickness and vertigo, and I actually find 2 special stages to be extraordinarily difficult, so they also don't change too much of the outcome, so in general I don't find it overly important to go after the Emeralds. One nice detail is you can actually retry the special stages from the pause menu as it's about to end. If you actually hit one of the exit bumpers or you run out of time, you'll automatically be booted out, so you want to make sure to pause right before you're going to get kicked out of the special stage. Moving on to Act 2, you might have noticed a prompt of Play Next Act, and that's because there's actually a world map where you can actually select different levels. Most of the zones can actually be played out of order in Sonic 4, but for the sake of this playthrough, we'll be playing through an order using the Play Next Act shortcut. One nice thing in Sonic 4 is each act has its own gimmick, so for example, we now have these vines that we can use to swing across. We also have different music in each act as well, though I do prefer the Sonic 3 method of having the same song but remixed to signify different acts. In general, Sonic 4 is a game that, as oxymoronic as this may sound, is interestingly bland in that it's so derivative of other games that it loops around to actually being really fascinating. I think as a game it actually isn't that interesting, but the surrounding details of it are. For example, we are in a post-mania world, so it's fascinating to actually look back at this game and think about how that's basically what Sonic 4 was trying to do but done correctly. 
And likewise, I also feel like this game set the franchise on the trajectory that it's still on, even as late as Sonic Frontiers, for better or worse, in that most Sonic games since Episode 1 have tried to incorporate elements of classic Sonic. So, with this game coming out in 2010, and Episode 2 actually releasing after Generations, I feel like that was the start of Sonic games relying a lot on nostalgia. I actually really like Act 3 of this zone, partly because it reminds me a lot of a level in Sonic Advance 3, which was actually the only Sonic Advance game I grew up with. I think it's Sunset Hill Zone, which at least was trying to be a little bit more overt and just trying to be Green Hill Zone rather than this. I think it even used a remix of the Green Hill Zone theme, if I, if I recall correctly. And the similarities actually make a lot of sense because Sonic 4 was developed by Dimps, the makers of Sonic Advance and Sonic Rush. For better or worse, we'll definitely see some very Dimps-like design choices, even as someone who likes Sonic Rush, I definitely question some of the level design in those games. And I also feel like this makes sense given the context of Dimps as a company, given that they actually started from former SNK developers, and they actually worked on a game for the Neo Geo Pocket Color called Sonic Pocket Adventure, which was essentially a handheld 8-bit remake, or demake actually, of Sonic 2, with some elements of Sonic 3, but also incorporated the modern designs for Sonic and crew, including Dr. Robotnik. So in a way, I almost feel like Sonic 4 works better as a spiritual successor to Pocket Adventure than the actual original trilogy, which definitely has its own unique aesthetics from the modern era, while this is definitely trying to blend the two as Pocket Adventure did. Again, I do find this look very fascinating. It's very glossy, which reminds me a lot of Sonic Heroes specifically, and Shadow the Hedgehog. And in general, that glossiness was very disliked at the time. Overall, the art style was one of the big sticking points of why the fanbase did not like this game as soon as it was announced. One interesting thing in Sonic 4 is we have the three-act structure of Sonic 1. However, the boss, kind of like Sonic CD, is in their own zone. So we have a throwback to the old Wrecking Ball from Sonic 1, except this time we have a homing attack, which makes this a little bit trivial. But obviously Dr. Robotnik also has some tricks up his sleeve. I'll still call him Dr. Robotnik because this is a 2D game, even though he's basically Eggman at this point. So he'll basically swing it around like that, but overall this fight is relatively straightforward. And with that, we have finished up Splash Hill Zone, so we'll have to see what awaits us next. Next up is Casino Street Zone, a zone that will probably call the wrong thing multiple times as we make our way through here. This is basically just Casino Night from Sonic 2. So one interesting thing in Episode 1 is it borrows heavily from the zones of the first two games, and the choices are interesting. To me, it'd be like if Sonic Mania had picked, like, 
Labyrinth Zone instead of Green Hill Zone for its uh, Sonic 1 representation. Some of the picks are definitely very curious, and I definitely would have gone with different stages to draw aesthetics for, uh, and also draw difficulty choices from as well, because some of the later stages in Sonic 1 and 2 are very notoriously difficult, and I feel like borrowing aesthetics from them definitely sends a very interesting message. So yeah, we have a casino stage, it's pretty straightforward, but overall, it's not too bad. In general, Sonic 4 isn't actually that difficult from what I recall. Some areas can be a little bit cheap, like I remember certain boss fights can be a little bit frustrating in that regard, though the original games suffered from that too as well, like with the Death Egg robot that you have to fight without any rings in Sonic 2. So like in the classic era, we have a couple of very sharp difficulty spikes, but beyond that, I do feel like Sonic 4 is a relatively straightforward experience. In general, I almost wish it actually had a little bit more cohesion, but we'll get to that in part 2 once we go through that. It was originally planned to be 3 episodes, but because of poor sales for part 2 specifically, it only ever got to 2 episodes unfortunately. So again, I'll have more to say about that once we get through episode 2, but it is a very interesting game from that standpoint, that episode 1 did actually have better reception and sales compared to part 2, and I do feel like timing matters given that this was in 2010, so at this point, there wasn't a lot in terms of 2D Sonic games. So, expectations definitely hurt part 2 more than part 1, oddly enough. I'll be honest, now I'm trying to actually think about which Sonic games would have been out at this point. This would have been late 2010, so I'm trying to think of whether Sonic Colors, for example, would have been released by this point. I think it would have. I thought that was around the same time. And actually, the DS version was also done by Dimps, and honestly is actually one of their best Sonic games in my opinion. Other than just the framework of Sonic Colors, it's a pretty solid Sonic Rush 3, essentially. So for Act 2 of Casino Street, we have these little playing cards that'll flip around that will try to knock us off these little, essentially, platforms, but we also have these other cards that we can run through and basically try to match symbols to gain items. Doing so will give you a ton of lives, so if you're struggling with this game, definitely come back here to grind for lives if you need to. Overall, I feel like this is when we start to see the real dimps inspiration for the level design, things start to get a little bit cheap feeling from this point on. There are definitely some points where in the classic era, you'd basically have land below you, but you'd have a less optimal path if you fall, while Dimps games tend to just have a lot of bottomless pits. So I do feel like that is one of the biggest differentiating features of classic Sonic level design and Dimps 2D Sonic design. It creates a very different sense of tension given that mistakes are not only in terms- like in the, the older games, mistakes would slow you down basically, and Sonic is a game where once you get really good at it, you can go really fast, and that sense of speed is very fulfilling once you've already kind of mastered it. But with Sonic- uh, with the Dimps Sonic games, mistakes are just death, so you have to be a lot more careful, and I think this is a good example of that as I immediately mess up a jump, so we'll have to very carefully make our way across, like so. I'm pretty sure at the very end there's also a bridge of cards that if you don't jump at the very end, the card will flip and you'll die at the very end of the level, so I also have to remember to keep that in mind. We also have these little bumper enemies that will knock us backwards, which is not great either. I could not see where I was going, so I'm really glad there was land. Also, we can't jump through the cards, so you actually do have to approach from the side. This is what I was talking about earlier. I do feel like in certain games like this, giving you a checkpoint this close to the end is literally just because of that bottomless pit. It's definitely very bad level design in my opinion.
For Casino Street Zone Act 3, we now have cannons to launch out of. In general, I do like some of the stage gimmicks. Some of them can be really annoying though. Also, this is part of the reason why I didn't want to go after the Chaos Emeralds, because in the later stages, it's actually really hard for me to get to the end of the stages without losing all my rings right before, because of usually some weird cheap shot by the game. So it's just easier to not have to worry about the Chaos Emeralds, and again, they don't really change a whole lot anyway. Yeah, actually, I highly recommend Sonic Colors DS. It's actually a really solid game. I do remember some annoying level design in those games too, in that game too, to be honest. All the Rush games have some problems. Rush 1 has a very interesting choice to it, where the Casino Zone is actually the middle of the game. But for Blaze the Cat, you actually start on the Casino Zone, so if you actually unlock Blaze and think, I want to play a different character than Sonic, you will have a rude awakening because you'll basically be thrown into the middle of the game uh, in terms of difficulty. So that is a very sharp difficulty spike if you just started Sonic's story and didn't actually go through the entire thing before swapping over to Blaze's story. So yeah, in general, Timp's games have some interesting choices uh, for overall difficulty scaling and level design. And yeah, there are definitely some quirks, so again, a lot of these can also be attributed to classic design too. As much as I do like the classic games, and like Sonic 2 is one of my favorites, I'll also admit Sonic 2 has a lot of other garbage to it. Uh, mainly, I would say Oil Ocean onwards just ramps up in difficulty so fast and is very, very unforgiving. Specifically Metropolis, but also uh, Wing Fortress gives me a lot of trouble, and the, obviously the Death Egg Zone used to give me a lot of trouble because of having to fight it without any rings, but because of like how much I played Sonic 2, I do feel like I have a better understanding of like the patterns for that fight. So I don't actually have as much trouble with it as I used to, uh, but I still feel like not giving you any rings at all, and also making fights over Sonic without a checkpoint isn't exactly the best design there. But again, Sonic 2 was also a very rushed game. So Sonic 4's development history was somewhat interesting because, if I'm not mistaken, it was actually supposed to come out sooner, but interestingly enough, it actually leaked. So the leak was very poorly received, and then it was delayed a bit, though it didn't change too much. But this zone actually indicates one of the things that was actually changed about this game, and that's its name. In the background of certain scenes, you can actually see signs that say Sonic the Portable, because this was actually basically designed to be a iPhone spin-off and not a main series game, but partway through development, it got renamed Sonic 4. Honestly, that is probably one of the worst choices they could have made, because when you call something Sonic 4, expectations immediately skyrocket. Everyone is expecting something on par with those classic games, and if we had gotten something like this, which is not horrendous I'd say, but also not nearly at that same caliber, I think people would have felt a little bit more warmly about this game. I think people would have been a little bit more forgiving of it, because if it's like treated as a spin-off, it wouldn't feel as bad. It'd be like if the advanced games were called Sonic 4. It would hurt those games' reception, just because when you hear Sonic 4, you expect something. And that's also why I feel like Sonic Mania actually got away with more as well, because it also went with essentially like a spin-off slash nostalgia moniker, rather than trying to sound like a new mainline Sonic game. Which Mania, even though it is a fantastic game, I do feel like because it relies so much on nostalgia, it doesn't quite rise to the level of something like Sonic 3. But again, I'd love to go through Mania at some point, so I'll save some of my thoughts on that for later. I don't like this jump, I just remembered, because you basically have one shot to get this easily because then the rings are gone, making it hard to line up. And that was just me misinputting and accidentally having that register as a double tap, uh, activating the homing attack. So yeah, in general, the homing attack does rely, uh, the game does rely a lot on the homing attack, which was also very polarizing given that it basically results in very automated level design, unlike the old games.
and we've made it to the boss of Casino Street Zone, and it's actually basically just the Carnival Night boss. Casino Night? Again, there are so many Casino Zones in Sonic, I often mix up the names of them, and when you have a zone like this that's deliberately calling back to it, I almost feel like that doesn't help. Again, I almost wonder if this game would have been better received if it just called everything explicitly after certain zones. Like, if this was just called Casino Night, would people feel better about it than trying to basically call it like Carnival Street or Casino Street to basically indicate, oh yeah, this is just inspired by, and by inspired it means basically a very much inspired by, as in it's practically the same thing, just with like, again, different music and some stage gimmicks. Again. Naming things actually does matter because it does set the expectations of what you're getting, and again, I do almost feel like that's one of the biggest things that Sonic 4 did wrong, was just not managing expectations well. And we're moving on to Lost Labyrinth Zone. And this is kind of what I mean by some of the choices are interesting. I feel like if you were to make a spiritual successor to a Sonic game, patterning something after Labyrinth Zone of all things probably wouldn't be a very smart call. And yet here we are, this is basically Labyrinth Zone. We have one more zone after this, and I'll say the exact same thing about that zone as well. Um, but again, I feel like if you were to bring back certain stages, uh, this is not one that'd be at the top of most people's lists of stages to bring back. I almost feel like Dimps games in general, in addition to just having a ton of bottomless pits, also have a lot of blind jumps as well. And in a widescreen game especially, that's almost kind of surprising to me. I feel like in the older Sonic games, you'd occasionally have blind jumps just because you're going so fast and can't really see what's ahead of you. But in Sonic 4, it's actually a different problem in my opinion. It's more that you can't see what's below you. I almost feel like... I don't know if it's just me, but I almost feel like the camera's centered on Sonic too much. I kind of wish it was actually kind of pulled back slightly, and also slightly and at an angle to the side, basically, like off-center to the side. Because if Sonic was slightly to the left, I think that would actually help a lot, because then you'd be able to see ahead a bit better. But again, I almost feel like Sonic being so centered, I almost feel like it's really hard to see things below you sometimes. Um, but again, it's very fascinating how much this game tries to take inspiration for, uh, take inspiration from the classic games, but then basically ends up just copying. And I almost feel like, again, that's an area where Mania actually succeeded a little bit better in just being transparent. Like, yeah, this is literally just Green Hill Zone. We're not even going to try to sugarcoat this at all. Uh, while this game tries to sort of hide that it's just being very derivative. In a way, I almost feel like this game coming out when it did makes me wonder how much games like New Super Mario Bros. and other, like, retro throwback games were the inspiration for this. I know there are a lot of games, like on WiiWare, for example. Uh, by the way, this game was released for PS3, 360, WiiWare, and now is available on Steam, which is the version I'm currently playing. Um, but Episode 2 is actually not on Wii, and that caused a lot of problems as well, but I'll save my thoughts on that for when we get to Episode 2. Overall, this is still better than Labyrinth Zone because there's less drowning involved, but again, the less I have to be reminded of Labyrinth Zone, the better, even as someone who actually probably likes Labyrinth more than most, so to be fair, uh, the last time I played Sonic 1 was through the Origins collection, and having infinite lives and widescreen definitely makes that a lot more tolerable, so my opinion is kind of shaped by that. <laughs> 